Uh, good morning, councillors. <clears throat> good morning, staff. Good morning, guests to the um, chamber today. Welcome all, special councillors, to what is the um, premier committee of Mayor Denia's reign. Um, this is the, this is where it really happens. We build roads, we toss all roads, we do cycleways, we build libraries, we update elderly housing. We do everything here, and we monitor how we're going. So, hence, welcome along. I see we have a full muster, so no need to call for apologies. Um, there is no consideration of the light items. Councillors, um, you've read the agenda today. I just ask, is there any interest, conflicts of interest you anyone wish to declare? Councillor Sol. Um, Mr Chair, I um, just wish to declare an interest in the um, community gardens at Waihi Beach. I do belong to the um, organisation that's presenting. That's fine. I'm sure a lot of councillors are involved in activities close to their home, so thank you for that. Um, councillors, just remind you, today's meeting is being live streamed, so everything you say exists forever in YouTube land, so just for your warning. Right, with that, we move to public forum. We don't need to move into that. No, we go straight to that. Welcome, Kyle. If you like to come up the front there. You've got your five minutes to um, address councillors on your concerns. Carl Beetham, Tapuna Kati Kati Connection. It's me, Yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone, um, and thank you for having me at, um, at your meeting. Uh, my name is Carl Beetham, uh, and I have a property at um, 177 Woodland Road in Kati Kati. Um, today, I'd like to present a brief story about concerns that residents made over the years about safety um, on Woodland Road, and I'd like to um, describe the experience that those residents received. My goal is not to um, raise a specific safety issue, um, but to highlight that the way that the Council and Waka Katahi responded to these concerns seems to be flawed. Um, my, my hope is that under the, the new initiatives, such as Road to Zero, um, there's been some changes being made. This, the example I'm gonna give um, is from a number of years ago. Um, and so that is why I'm hoping that, um, that uh, things are different and would like to hear what, you know, what those differences are. Um, so this here is a folder which was given to me by my neighbor, Kerry Williams, now deceased. He tried for many years to get the council to take action on a dangerous part of the road near his house. He knew it was dangerous because there was an accident in the same area approximately every three months. Kerry and other neighbors raised their concerns through mail, phone calls, visits to the council um, and attending meetings. Um, the residents were clear as they could be that there was an issue stating in, in uh, this particular mail that uh, it is only a matter of time before a fatal accident occurs. The residents wanted the speed limit reduced on the road. That was their main request. Eventually, um, the event that the residents warned the council about occurred. Uh, a neighbor of mine was um, on the road and was hit by a car and sustained permanent brain damage. After that, the speed limit was reduced. So these were my observations. Um, from from the, um, the wooden road example, it seems to me, um, and, and it's kind of borne out through some of the documents in here, that the roading engineers favor their own models and schedules above direct feedback from residents. The, the residents see the road every day. They know the behavior of drivers on the road. They know in incredible detail the risks of the road and can predict the future better than any roading engineers model. Yet it appears to me that this information is given the lowest priority. In fact, from the memos I've obtained, it seems there are barriers in place which prevent the council from prioritizing direct resident feedback. It also appears that there is or was a great deal of inefficiency and inability to clearly recognize what is important and what isn't important. Um, in terms of my wishes, um, what I'm hoping to hear today is that under um, the road to zero and with changes in people, things have changed. I'm hoping to hear that um, feedback from residents is now given the highest priority 
and that rating risk models are recognised as being flawed, outdated, and also missing important information. I'm hoping that the experience of the Woodland Road residents is not being repeated by other residents on other roads. Um, what I'd also like to do is just show you. Um, so this is this is the, the documentation just for the Woodland Roads area. This is this is the folder of comp complaints, and here um, are all of the photos that people have compiled over the years of all of the accidents, and and these didn't lead to anything. Um, this folder here, which I like to leave, um, indicates some of the barriers that are in place to residents getting their concerns addressed properly. This is a folder full of internal documents and memos and mails um, within the council um, obtained through uh, an official information request, um, which came to no outcome. This is a mail, uh, a folder of the mails from within council showing the point at which uh, councillors and mayors start to get annoyed and panic sets in and things start to finally happen. And um, this is a folder um, uh, indicating that the thing that everybody said would happen actually did happen and that um, a neighbour of mine was seriously injured. Um, and, and that's really um, the illustration that I'd like to, to bring um, and happy to have any questions. Thank you, Kyle, for that. Um, and before I open it up for questions, I'll just start with one. I acknowledge your frustration and your documentation you have there. Can I just ask a question about the state of the speed limit today as it stands? Yep. So, Is that satisfactory to... So it's still, no, no, so, do you want to touch on that then, the current and what you think it should be out there? Well, well I think what everyone was asking for was 70. You know, 70... Um, was probably a reasonable limit for the housing then. It probably should be lower now. This was a few years ago. Um, but even after the person was hit, the limit was lowered to 80. And I think the residents saw that as a little bit of an insult as well, that even when the thing happened, that everyone said what happened, happened, they still didn't get what they re you know, requested. So. Councillors, any questions of Kyle? Mike, Councillor Mogan. Apart from the fact that we share your frustration, um, tell me, and you talked about the road to zero, are you aware that the road to zero, they are actually trying to change how we do speed limits because it's outside council's control? Mm. And it seems as though we know the area, we know the people, we know the roads, but we have to go through the bureaucratic process with the transport agency and it takes so much time, mm -hmm. but the road to zero, I think it has been changed. Mr. Chairman, would it be possible to sort of explain that briefly? It's changing the policy. I'll hand it over to Deputy CEO. So uh, nationally, the, the um, Ministry of Transport NZK have gone through and um, categorised all roads in the country with what they call a safe and appropriate speed. Um, and then there's a process that's going to occur uh, through this year in terms of going through uh, a process through the regional council and this council to go, uh, those are the speeds that the council want to recommend uh, for those roads. So on the top, off the top of my head, I can't tell you what the recommendation is for Woodlands Road, but we'll, we'll be able to tell you later. My, my main hope is, is it's not really a Woodlands Road um, thing. It's really that when you get direct feedback from people who live there and they and they see the behavior every day and they know how the road is changing over time the the information they provide is of much higher value and much higher quality than any of the models that you use to predict the risk so when you do get that feedback that should be treated as gold um, in my where i work we go to great pains to get to, in, feedback from actual people people are giving it to you and you're not valuing it i think that's the issue Thank you, Carl. Oh. I might just get Jim Patterson, our transportation manager, just to confirm, but I think at the time, so 2013, Jim, 70, was 70 an option or was it 80 and 60s? Uh, I'm not sure back then. Uh, Waka Kotahi haven't supported in the past 70s and 90s, but more recently with the change with the road to zero, they are an option, but the safe and appropriate speed that 
Wakakotahi have looked at all the networks in the country, indicate the Woodland Road could have a safe and appropriate speed of 60 kilometres an hour. Yeah, I'll go with that, yeah. Um, again, Woodland Road is, is almost a red hearing. It's really just this behaviour and valuing the, the direct feedback from, from local people above whatever models, whatever um, you know, other guidelines you have. The, the people will tell you, you know, what is the best thing to do. And I think it would be great if that was baked into the, the way that we, you know, we treat and process feedback from people. Thanks, Carl. I can add that it's not entirely the decision of council. There has to be the feedback and the input from NZTA and the New Zealand Police as to whether it's appropriate anyway. We could make a road 40 k's if we want, but it could have been overruled in the past. It was been council. Sorry, I don't, don't know if um, Margaret got an answer to the question. Is the system changing? And will the change allow us to put more weight on residents' views? Because I heard yeah, in the ether and through the media that there are changes coming, but yeah, we just um, we haven't had anything official. It may, it may, not, may be too far down the track yet, I don't know. So the, the system is changing. So it's changed from the bylaw process to the, the new safe and appropriate speed road to zero process. In actual fact, the council will have less input into the speed limits. Okay, so it doesn't sound like it's moving forward. Right. Council Sol. Mr. Chair, yeah, I just really basically want to ask one question. Well, maybe two, sorry. Um, one is the the shall we say offending vehicles, are they largely non-resident? And was the 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 um, incident that you're referring to, was that from a somebody resident along there or working that normally works along there or was it just somebody that randomly was taking a drive i just uh, trying wood, to get that picture yeah, wooden road um is a is a dead end road so most of the traffic uh, is from locals um because it's actually a long dead end road people go quite quickly in the first third um because they're in a hurry to get to their end of the road um the incident which occurred um was in the first k and a half um of of the road Right. Well, thank you, Carl, for coming in. Um, we hope some further adjustment eventuates there and uh, residents... Uh, thank you very much, and thank you for having me. Thank you. Right, councillors, we have a first presentation for today. I welcome James Smith, Chief Operating Officer of the National Road Carriers Association, and he's got a presentation which we have loaded to our stellars. Welcome, James. Good day. Uh, what we'll do is I'll run through um, the presentation and then welcome questions on all things um, transport. And uh, yeah, regarding Road to Zero, we're actively uh, participating in that discussion, uh, and especially when it comes to the 70 and 90 uh, limits. Quite a fan of the 90s. Um, because it's, uh, yeah, any reason in particular, uh, yeah. But um, but in all seriousness, we I was part of a, a, a working party several years ago that introduced the 90k speed limit on the State Highway 2, um, which was at the time a road of death, uh, and just by lowering it to 90, um, plus a cup, moving some centre medium barriers around, uh, or, white lines, we, we, we stop the deaths. So yeah, certainly subtle changes to speed limits um, are long overdue um, in, in New Zealand. For far too long we've used that 100k default setting. All right, so let's uh, kick off. <laughs> if we pressed a space bar. Right. Okay, we use that. Okay. All right. Okay, so about us. So National Road Carriers is a transport association. We're made up of commercial transport operators. Okay, so effectively, in other words, we're the supply, our members are the supply chain. So currently we have around about 1,500 members that represent about 20,000 trucks. Uh, in addition to the trucks, we also have members that operate coastal shipping uh, and uh, inter-island ferries and things like that. And... Uh, as of this morning, we have also have members that don't operate aircraft. 
So uh, the Freightways Group joined us. So, um, so that's why uh, pretty much if it's a transport uh, question, uh, if we don't know, we'll have connections with someone uh, that, that does. Uh, we work in very close partnership with a, another association based in Christchurch that looks after um, South Island uh, predominantly, although they do have members up here, and likewise we have members in the South Island. Uh, so a little bit about um, supply chain. Uh, we've got about 155,000 uh, heavy trucks. Now that number's out of date. It's gone up since then. Um, we're just waiting for the latest numbers out of Ministry of Transport. Uh, but that's 3.5% of the total vehicle fleet. Uh, so the road, road transport industry is, is, contains about 40,000 transport businesses. Um, so predominantly ma and pa. So it's quite an interesting uh, very similar to all businesses. You've got everything from ma and pa right up to very large multinational corporations running. Uh, so 93% of freight, and in fact, actually that's gone up a bit because of recent events, but 93% um, freight moves by road. And the other key point there is every other mode needs road. So um, recently we were part of the um, coastal shipping review uh, or funding allocation model where we allocated out 30 million to coastal shipping. Um, and uh, it was, a, yeah, we were very supportive of that um, because there is opportunity for modal shift, uh, but it needs to be um, targeted. Uh, so answering um, someone's question from earlier, um, trucks contribute around about 3.24 billion or 13% of the 24 billion land transport fund. So even though we're 3.5%, we contribute 13%. Uh, so the roading network itself, now this has become a little bit more um, pertinent following um, Gabriel's um, visit, uh, but we have we are suffering from, and you'll get acknowledgement of this right, right through from um, Minister of Finance, um, cabinet ministers and opposition parties, uh, we are suffering from decades of underinvestment. Uh, and that's right across the whole transport network, is the rail included, rail, coastal shipping, roads, all underinvestment. So we've been kicking the can down the road uh, for, for decades. Uh, and it actually goes back to around about 1967 is when we stopped investing in infrastructure ahead of population and GDP growth. So we've got a lack of long-term coordinated planning uh, and that contributes to the state of eroding access. And I've, I've used one example there, which is forestry blocks, okay? So a tree takes approximately 30 years to grow, and yet everybody seems surprised when the logging truck turns up to pick up the timber. Okay, you've had 30 years of warning that that tree's going to come down, so it shouldn't be a surprise. And yet every, every year we get surprised. Um, why is there a logging truck suddenly appeared on this road? Um, and also you have um, long-term planning, a lot of money, like hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars of taxpayer, ratepayer money is wasted when projects stop and start. Uh, and we've seen that with, and that generally happens when you have a change of government or you have a change of minister or you have a change of something uh, and you have uh, hundreds of millions of dollars of planning, consenting, some cases land acquisition, and then that project is then put on hold and parked. Well, we never get that money back because it's never going to get cheaper. It consistently gets more expensive, and we're just flushing that money down the, down the drain. Now, that, that conversation is going to become very, very important as we look forward to um, how we're going to recover the infrastructure that, that the country's lost over the last couple of weeks. Uh, let's not waste it uh, on consulting and um, plat stopping and starting projects. If we actually built something, we might get value for our money. Uh, strategic, the strategic freight network is needed to lift productivity of business. So one of the challenges we have in New Zealand is we rank near the bottom of the productivity of the OECD uh, and we shift low price commodity uh, exports. Okay, so transport, uh, if you can make transport more efficient, more productive, uh, it's better for the whole economy. Uh, and there is opportunity uh, with the rebuilding of infrastructure to improve productivity, uh, get safety and decarbonisation. 
So our industry is decarbonising reasonably quickly, and that's simply because the technology is changing. Okay, you won't be able to buy a diesel truck after about 2030. Okay, so better integration of, of mapping data between local councils of Wakatahi needs to happen, and man, did we, that was a big issue um, when we're dealing with uh, Cyclone Gabriel. Uh, so congestion, uh, this, this is a number here, freight task grows by 1.5% of GDP, um, and that's generically, but there's significant variations by vertical. And, uh, and a lot of that stuff is actually predictable. So understanding within your region, the wider business that uh, requires freight uh, will help understand when those peaks and troughs are likely to occur. Um, and that can assist. Uh, improving access for um, higher mass, okay, reduces road trips required. Uh, an example of that is 50 max where effectively you got a 30% lift in productivity, which meant you had, if you hadn't have done it, you would have had more trucks shipped in the same amount of freight. And that's, no one wants that. Uh, Western Bay of Plenty uh, contains seasonal industries, yeah, the crowd peaks. You have got seasonal industries down here. Um, a lot of, um, you know, your, like your kiwi fruit season um, is well known as crowding, uh, very, significant peak in, in, in vehicles that you only see once a year on the roads. Uh, but they're known, right? They're not, a, it's not like something that suddenly appears. Uh, it, they're, they're known seasonal peaks, happens every year. Okay, so the issues facing our, our industry, and these will come as no surprise because they're pretty much facing every single business. Uh, we seem to have run out of staff, okay? So we're not, we're not uh, growing as an economy, our own enough um, people to uh, replace the people that are leaving uh, through acts of God and otherwise. Uh, we have a poor state of infrastructure. And again, that's no different. You'll have the same conversation with other people that rely on business, uh, on other forms of infrastructure. Uh, rise, rising costs, fairly rapidly rising costs, capital maintenance, compliance of fuel. Uh, Decarbonisation uncertainty, that's flagged in there because um, while these mixed messages coming on, it's very difficult to plan ahead. Okay, so, um, and we're, we're working with the central government on that one. So there's get stronger signals. Um, and you'll see the same, same from farmers. That's one of their big issues as well. Uh, political uncertainty, of course, uh, that's a, always a challenge, uh, especially in election year. Now, the good news, okay, there is good news regarding the Western Bar Plenty. When I ask their members out here, any particular issues relating to Western uh, Bar Plenty Council? Actually, didn't have any. They, they didn't have any um, things that were bothering them that were you, okay? There's things that are bothering them that are Waka Kotahi. There are things that are bothering them that are, that are uh, immigration and MB. Uh, but um, you guys in particular, so whatever you're doing, you haven't, uh, you don't have a whole pile of angry truck drivers about to turn up and pitchforks. So that's that's good news, isn't it? Okay. So um, uh, the... <laughs> yeah, okay, so good news. Right. So this is where we get to the fun part where you can ask um, questions. And don't, uh, and if, don't, if you've got a question and you don't want to ask it now, but you want to ask it later, um, just fire it through to us. Um, and again, because of the, there will be things that we can... Don't worry, James, they're not shy around here. If they've got a question, <laughs> they will ask you. Yeah. Yes. Right, councillors, any questions for James regarding land transport? Councillor Murray Bench. Who on earth told you it was good news from Western Bay? Have they not driven on State Highway 29? Uh, that's, that's, that's not your fault. That's Waka Kotahi. Right. So yeah. who are they yeah. telling? Uh, they're telling, we, we, we're, we're pushing hard central government to get increased funding for Wakakatai. So Wakakatai are currently 2,400 kilometres behind on the state highway renewal project, program. And that's because funding was, def, uh, was um, shall we say, reallocated uh, by successive, successive governments to pet projects and regional infrastructure uh, maintenance just fell further and further behind. Yeah, fell further and further behind. So there is currently, there's a deficit. Um, and it, I mean, that's a serious issue. There's two and a half thousand kilometres behind pavement renewal. And that's why uh, Minister Wood tipped 
additional money into the land transport fund in the last um, two years. And, uh, but unfortunately, what we've now had, of course, is successive weather events over multiple years. And so the North Island is even further behind. South Island, they're actually catching up. But North Island, we're in a, we've, got, we've got big problems. Did Mr. Did Mr. Woods tell you that he took Tapuna to Mokoroa off the 10-year plan with his yes. forward planning and left us in the lurch again? Yes. And State Highway 29, I must thank your truck drivers because to get through Cambridge Road onto 29, uh, it, the drivers are really good at letting us through. It is so congested. They don't take congestion into their planning transport agency. And it's a very frustrating place. How much money of what you contribute goes to cycling? None. Okay. Well, I think you're subsidising it. So um, there's actually, um, it's a good question because it's one of the myths out there, and we get it all the time from our members as well, that our money is being spent on cycleways. Uh, so that 24 point, uh, three million uh, billion, sorry, um, land transport fund. There's multiple contributors to that fund. So currently, uh, I'll have to go off the top here somewhere. But there's, there's around about 55 percent of that fund that comes from road users. The balance of that fund comes from central government and local government rates. So when you go and argue that your my road user charges or your fuel tax or whatever is being spent on on a cycleway or a, some other thing uh the government is very can very quickly come back and say that's not the case that 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 funding's coming from the money that they're putting in from the central uh government fund top up right so what our argument is moving forward is because we have such a deficit of investment and projects like the one you mentioned that are continually being kicked down the road, uh, that more of that money needs to be tipped into critical infrastructure, not the nice to haves on the end of it. Okay. So in that case, I think we'll be singing the same song to Michael Wood and Simeon Brown and whoever. Yeah. Thanks, James. Right, I've got Deputy John followed by Mayor James and then Councillor Crawford. Yes, um, you spoke about how constrained and how behind um, Waka Kotahi is in terms of renewals and, um, and projects. And uh, you also spoke about how by 2030, seven years' time, you don't expect we'll be able to buy a diesel truck. And so what message are you sending to the government about how to constrain, how to manage or increase the funding that's available to um, address these issues? Yeah, so the um, that non-arrival of diesel trucks is simply because people are going to stop making them. So you talk to Daimler uh, Group, Volvo Group, Scania Group, um, that's the reality. And we're already seeing electric and hydrogen vehicles um, hitting our road. Uh, the challenge that they have is I think there was a misconception by some in government that um, they wouldn't need roads, right? Okay, that, that decarbonisation would result in, in, in not need roads. Well, not only will they need roads because uh, they, they don't fly or float, uh, not only will they need roads, but these things are generally heavier, well, they, and they will be initially. Uh, they will come with around about a, between a 900 and one and a half tonne penalty. They are also horrifically expensive. Uh, so um, one of our members has just put on an electric truck. Uh, for example, um, the diesel equivalent is 80,000. The electric truck is 290,000. And he gets half the productivity out of it, right? Because it's got to be plugged in. Now, that is simply... Now, if you go... Now, his grand great-grandfather put the first petrol engine truck on, on Auckland roads, okay? His... They were horse and cart, they switched to petrol. And when you look at the correspondence that was written to his great grandfather, it's almost identical with, to what Chris is getting about his electric truck, right? So, what we're undergoing, we're undergoing a, a, a change, a modal change, right? And so, the, the technology is going to get better. But what we're saying to government is they need to get serious about pavements, 
uh, we need to move away from chip seal um, to, um, to, to better pavements. And you'll see on parts of the Waikato Expressway where they have done that, uh, that road is performing very well. Same with uh, most of Transmission Gully where they moved away from chip seal. The road is performing very well. So the problem with that is it's very expensive initially, but lasts a lot longer. It is also more resilient to adverse weather events. It drains better. Uh, it doesn't suffer from the problem that chip seal has where water gets in, uh, and tiny cracks and hydraulics out and you get potholes. So, uh, but that's gonna require, that's why we're pushing for a 50 year minimum and uh, plan for transport infrastructure to get it away from the three year political football that it is now. Um, did that answer your question? Sort of? Well, well, sort of, but I mean, how, yeah. are going to address, how are you encouraging them to address the funding issue? Oh, by, um, by going through all of the channels. We've now got acknowledgement from, in fact, you would have seen Minister of Finance acknowledge um, last week that they need to tip a whole pile more money into roading. Uh, and uh, the worry we have is when we get, a, if we get a change of government, because it's not, it's not a hundred percent guarantee. Um, when we get a change of government, will you get another flip flop? So that's why we're also at the same time talking directly with with ACT, with um, with 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 um, with National, to, to make sure that any gains we get under this team aren't then lost when you get a uh, a change in ideology. Okay, but it's it's a it's a long road, and it and, but it requires every single one of everybody to keep mentioning that these projects need restarting, this needs fixing. We certainly do our share around this table, yeah. yep. Yeah. I mean, Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, James, so, so what are your members' highest priorities for road improvements, firstly, in our district as a whole, yeah. and on our roads, either local roads? Yeah, so local, if I could address the local road ones. So some of the frustrations with local roads are where lane widths are taken up, you know, for soccer ones and things like that, where the road isn't narrow and is, is too narrow to start with, right? Um, so if you look at um, what we're starting to see in some areas is they're identifying key freight connector routes to local businesses, right? And saying, right, so how do we, how do we make, how do we get that connection to the, um, distribution hub or the, or the port, make that as smooth as possible, right? Um, so in some cases, it may mean you still want cycling. So you get, okay, we need to get the separated cycle path, get it, get them away from the conflict, okay? So, um, but the reality is we've got only X number of lane widths to, to play with. Um, and, but it, it is all about connect, connectivity. On the state highway network, that state highway 29 is a big, Big issue um, that um, yeah should have been a, should have been addressed as is connection to the port um, and the long term future things like the Kaimais and and uh, and and funnily enough increasing the rail capacity because um, we've got members that are desperately trying to use rail um, but can't because of lack of capacity. Right, looking to wrap this up, Councillor Crawford. Um, just in regards to um, road speed for heavy trucks. So my understanding like that 90k speed limit when a truck, especially as big trucks at sea, it starts really doing more exponential damage to roads. So, you know, um, we're talking about better um, better roading, but from the road, from the trucking side of it, yeah. just um, from their responsibility too when they drive on the road. Yeah. You'll, you'll find that um, I should say most responsible operators uh, would have um, 90 years there hardwired into the basically all, all new trucks you can speed limit them. There is other reasons why an operator would want to limit to 90. The biggest one is cost. Once you exceed 90, you start sucking fuel. And having run several large trucking fleets, when I hard, uh, hard you know, rigorously enforced a speed policy, and that was compliance to all speed limits, we got a 13 to 17% saving in fuel. 
Okay. So what we say is, yeah, we actively encourage members to uh, have a speed policy in place, and it's not just 90, it's all speed limits. Because if you get compliance to, um, uh, to those, you generally find traffic flows better. It's also one of the myths that by lowering a speed limit, you cause irreversible damage to the economy by stuff taking longer. New Zealand's just not big enough for that to be a significant factor. What has been done, there's been some evidence of it in Waikato District where they have altered some speed limits. Some have come down, some have gone up, so you get a better flow, right? So it's all about the total journey time. If, if you can get a better flow, less speeding up, slowing down, speeding up, slowing down, you get greater fuel efficiency, less, less wear and tear, and you actually, the stuff gets there faster. But yeah, if, if you've got operators that, are, that you know are exceeding 90, um, yeah, let us know because there's all sorts of things we can do with police to uh, to deal with that. Um, yeah. James, I've got one parting shot for you. Um, in terms of mega projects, obviously, second crossing of the Auckland Harbour, but closer to home here, a uh, potential Kaimai tunnel. How realistic is that? And is your group anyway advocating, and do you see any future that timeline on that? Decarbonisation has raised that one up again. Because obviously it would be uh, more efficient if you can reduce gradients. Uh, electric um, trucks like less of this. Um, so uh, decarbonisation has raised it. Um, there is limited political will for it um, nationally. They have talked about taking the top off, as in you know, making it just easing that top bit, uh, but yeah, I think every time there's an incident, um, and of course what's happened as a result of Gabriel now, of course, it means there's now a, a whole pile more uh, that where communities are completely cut off. So, um, but but yeah, it is, it is on the list. Well, thank you. I'll yeah. pass that one on to my grandkids to sort out yeah. that one. Um, <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much for coming in today. That's okay. Councillors, can I have a move and a second to receive the report? Councillor Sol, Councillor Mari Ben, shall I put that all in favour? Right. Let's get that to clear it, Kerry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right. Councillors, just a procedural motion on slight change from when the agenda was um, put together. We want two slight changes. One is a moving of the SCADA system presentation later in the day after a confidential section. So we're pushing that back. And second, we're moving up the border, Waihi Beach and bumping down the town centre plan. So hopefully that describes it roughly what you're about to move in second. So Councillor Granger, Councillor Cox said, to change the order, all those in favour? Those against, thank you. Clear that carried. So Waihi Beach. So if you're looking for it, it's still, everything's still on the agenda, just dealing with it in a slightly different manner. I'm trying to find that for you. Uh, page 13, reclassification, Waihi Beach, Plunkett Reserve and Beach Road Recreation Reserve. Page 13 in your agenda. <coughs> Welcome, Peter. And you've got. Hi, I'm Rose Fox, colleague who's been working on the project. <laughs> we are endeavouring to get a bigger table for future presenters, <laughs> but today you're squeezing. Right, Peter, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, primarily for the benefit of new councillors, this is probably your first um, kind of lease process you've worked through. So, just a bit of background on how this works. So. Under the Reserves Act, wherever um, a community group wants to come and use, might be a sports club, in this case, the, the, the garden arrangements here, um, and you want to occupy an area of public reserve land, we have a process to go through under the Reserves Act, which is what we're doing here today. So the initial process is for the committee, in this case, the Projects and Monitoring Committee, to consider in principle what's being applied for, because effectively what your decision making needs to, to think about going forward is that this area of land, which is currently just mowing open space, um, is going to be occupied by another community use, and that 
we need to give the wider community the opportunity to have their view on that. So a report comes up to this committee. Um, if you agree in principle, then that instructs staff to go off under section 119 and 120 of the Reserves Act. We undertake a one month period of public consultation. Um, we'll be writing to adjoining property owners or go to the community board for comment and the general public. Anyone in New Zealand can give a submission. So. so once we've completed that process, we then bring those submissions and I do a further report. But that report goes back to full council. The reason being is under the Reserves Act, the full council is the administrating body in the Reserves Act. They can't delegate its decision-making process to a subcommittee. So just to facilitate the process and get the moving underway, we have um, this process here, if you agree in principle, we'll get it out there, but it comes back to the full, full council. So we don't necessarily need to go to the full council up front, but the ultimate decision-making, once you've have an open mind and considered all the submissions and objections, we must call for objections and submissions, uh, then you make your decision based on, on that there. So that's just a bit of background for the benefit of the new councillors, because um, you'll be getting a few of these over the next three years of your term. <laughs> um, but So just speaking to got your Pippa and Rose here, so Pippa's gonna get a bit of a presentation to, to run through shortly. Um, this is community driven. So we're responding to a, a community initiative. Effectively, um, this is something, and my understanding has fallen out of the community plan up at Waihi Beach that they've developed, and it's been a real robust process. We're dealing with a lot of initiatives coming out of that community plan, um, this being one of them. So we just uh, work through. So what I'll do is I'll just let Pippa take take you through um, the aspirations and speak for it, because now I'll speak better for Pippa than Pippa. <laughs> and um, then I'll be here to ask, answer any um, technical or reserves that questions you may have. Pippa, we just, oh yeah, I'll bet it's on. Yep. Okay. Uh, ora koutou. Thank you very much for the opportunity to sit um, in front of the members today. Um, I am an environmental coordinator for Live Well Waihi Beach, so we look and focus at community-based um, kopapa and what's required in the community. Um, and part of this, we've been looking at designing a community garden, a marakai. Um, not just any marakai, uh, the ones that have previously been um, put in place uh, in Waihi Beach have failed. So I had to kind of go back to the very beginning and have a look at why this was, the sustainability of the garden. And had a look also at that point um, with regards to food sovereignty, um, indigenous and cultural heritage and seed sovereignty. Um, as you're aware, um, Cyclone Gabriel is probably the best example where many parts of New Zealand have now been cut off. And community gardens provide community resilience within um, areas and pockets and have been for many, many years um, internationally. We have over 3,000 permanent residents at Waihi Beach and we have different socio-economic backgrounds of those people. So we're talking people that can't feed themselves, put uh, money on the table to, as you know, multi-millionaires. So we've been looking at the uh, T Toiti Aura Health and Wellbeing Population Survey, which was undertaken in 2020 for the Western Bay of Plenty, and 27% at that time um, were worried about not having enough money to buy food. Now, obviously, since 2020, um, cost of food have been spiraling out of control. And we're talking uh, nutrient-rich um, fruit and vegetables. So we went on a journey. Um, we worked with uh, Hapu, uh, Tifano Atofo. Uh, we worked with the school. We worked with the men's shed. We worked with many different um, people within the community and pulled together a management group. Um, Rose here is one of the individuals that has volunteered 
many, many hours on this project. And do you want to just quickly introduce yourself for us? Oh, hi. Um, yes, my name's Rose Fox. I'm a registered architect, ANZIA, and I'm um, a long time Waihi Beach um, visitor as a, as a holiday maker, and now I live there. Um, I've had over 20 years experience as an architect and uh, I'm a senior architect. So for me, the opportunity to bring that skill set to a local community where those skills are not readily found in any great number has been uh, a very worthwhile thing and I, I hope will contribute to the success of the project and that we've I can actually contribute to the design something that will um, help create a physical representation of the objectives that leads to better flexibility and resilience. Great, thanks for us. Um, we've actually got um, a better plan. This was the concept plan. We've now got a preliminary plan that um, we can show you. So we've been working with the school, with Waihi Beach School. I've been working with the children. Um, we've been designing um, the garden on Matariki and the nine fetu, the nine stars. Um, I have learned very, very quickly that I'm not very good as a teacher. It's very much hard work. Um, and I take my hat off to all the teachers at Waihi Beach School and all the teachers internationally, because it was an interesting task for me and a very big learning curve. Um, but this is our initial design. We went in and spoke to the children about each um, of Fetu, of Matariki, and then we worked with them. And this is when Rose come, came on board. I'd go and do the teaching element and then come and sit down with Rose and say, this is what the, the Tamariki have pulled out of this particular star. Now, the, the guidelines were basically um, food sovereignty, um, cultural history, and Purako for the area, so the stories of the area, so Tuhua um, and Otafafi, and um, working with that. So from that, um, we have looked at the food resilience and the outcomes of this project were enhancing community cohesion. Um, and at the moment, the, even the design of the Marakai has seen this enhancement of community cohesion. As I said, we've, been, we've fostered so many different backgrounds in, with regards to this project from five-year-olds to 90-year-olds um, and a, a different cultural perspective. Uh, and the community balance. Um, it also looks at the sustainable uh, UN Sustainable uh, Development Goals, number 11 as well, and making cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. And all we can do is grow further from this project. It's, it's really been quite an experiential uh, educational learning experience for everybody as well. We've been out in the field. Um, and we've worked with Peter, who's been absolutely incredible throughout the whole process. Um, and I would like to give my thanks, Peter, for that. Um, so enhancing community cohesion, a commitment to community resilience and sustainability. Um, the growth of the food will be um, administered by the pr principles of permaculture and um, will actually be offsetting our carbon footprint with regards to the garden, um, and then we'll be carbon negative, so we'll be putting carbon into the atmosphere. This is the first of its kind in New Zealand, so it's pretty progressive. We'll be the second Maori working Maori garden in New Zealand, other than Hamilton Gardens, and I took 88 children up to Hamilton Gardens for a look around at Te Parapara, which is is the garden um, up there. Um, it's the Akumara garden, that's it. This is a whole host of uh, different gardens involved in this. So I'm just gonna put you over to Rose because this is Rose's work here. Um, lucky you, lucky if, you can get, if you can get the mouse yeah, working. Yeah, if I can get the mouse to go. Can we swap? Oh. All right. No, the, this one's got several pages on it, it should have. Oh. No. I'll break everything while yeah. I... So is that good? You can hear yep. me now. Is this a mouse mouse? She's controlling it. Oh. So, can we go to the plan? Down. Oh, well, maybe we'll start there. Go back one. 
go back one. Uh, just an overview. Um, the left hand is a site location plan. Um, you can see that it's at the north end of Waihe Beach, um, which is, I guess, we would like to introduce more later on down the line if this works. But um, this was just an ideal spot. Um, and North End is pretty accessible to most people. They're used to going to the village. So it's kind of within Kui of the village. Um, on the right, it shows the extent of the land that we would like to use within the existing park. Very aware that there are people who are using that park at the moment for sports activities with kids. So we've left space for that to still occur. And then plan, plan the next one down. Um, this is the very, very beginning overview. So by taking the Matariki star, um, literally in terms of planning, it actually sits on the site quite nicely. And what it does is it gives us the opportunity to create a discrete set of garden areas with different character and different um, size and potentially a different intention with respect to the garden, a different aspect. So we can get variety, but it also gives us um, the ability to be flexible and resilient moving forward because we either have an overarching one management committee that manages the whole thing, or you allocate a specific garden to a specific group who then take ownership. And this can be fluid as we move forward, but it also means that we can overlay a number of principles of sustainability and permaculture across the garden and each has a focus area. Um, and the layout itself led it very readily to a nice kind of connectivity between all the gardens with that kind of thing. So the main Matariki star is in fact the main meeting and the heart of the garden. And as you can see, that's the one with the pergola around it. Can we go to the um, landscape plan? Yeah, so we're lucky to have worked with a very talented landscape designer as well, who's overlaid into this some planting and also a variety of garden types, which again gives us the um, ability to really extend and um, showcase if you like and provide education in a number of different techniques um, which again will produce resilience and also um, that that choice gives people the opportunity to learn and to then pick up what is useful to them personally um, maybe my plan hmm. next uh, up to I think if you've looked at this, you'll see that we've looked at, um, this is just showing some of the um, possibilities there. It's my out? colored one up there above. Oh no, maybe, no, 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 that's all right. So go to the um, the 3Ds, the, the multi 3Ds of the smaller areas. No, no, that was the, the third sheet, I think, second or third. I'd just like to point out on this one, uh, on the right-hand side, that was our initial drawing with the school. It was one punga tree with a circle. So um, it's been quite a long process. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Thank you. Um, just obviously this is um, liable to change as we dig deeper into how exactly it works. But what I'd like to show here is that... Um, there's a richness that we can obtain by having taken this Matariki idea and then applied it in multiple different places. And um, it's also allowed us to provide a different focus in each area that covers a wide ranging group of topics. Um, so we're looking at variety, diversity, multi-faceted character. 
Um, the focus when we're looking at the planting is that, um, what is it, seed? Sovereignty. Sovereignty, Sovereignty. Um, and food. Um, we probably also, you know, it'll grow, it'll change. But what we've got here is something that provides us with a resilience in that it's incredibly flexible. And so whatever and however it develops, we're, we're going to be able to run with that. So with the best of intentions, um, I think it, this gives us the best chance to achieve them. And the facility, it is a facility. It's not just a community garden. There will be areas for education, for schools to come in. It's fully accessible. We're working with the Hellberg um, Foundation, Dave McKelman, um, to make sure all the gardens are accessible. We're talking to the schools, goldfields, et cetera, to bring children in with learning and um, uh, learning disabilities. Um, we'll have sensory gardens in there for the aut autistic kids to come in and learn uh, and, and enjoy um, the gardens. But it's also... a an area where people will connect in the community. The buy-in that we've, we've, we've undertaken a survey um, and at the moment it sits at nearly 84% of our community um, uh, agree that the proposal's um, a very good one. And that's been sent out to three and a half thousand people. We've got uh, just under five, just over five and a half percent that disagree, um, believing it's a waste of money. Um, there's a lot of statistics behind the fact that this isn't a waste of money. Um, the statistics don't come from New Zealand. We just haven't got the capability. But if you have a look at the 299,000 gardens in the US, they've looked at all of those. And out of every dollar invested in those gardens, $6 comes out within a five-year total. So it's a, it's a great investment for the community. Right. So thank you, Rose and uh, Pippa, for that. Very comprehensive and very well planned out. Councillors, before you address the issues on recommendations, page 13, 14, are there any questions that either of the presenters have come in this morning? No? Oh, Mr. Councillor Joyce? So I'm just wondering, what happened to the previous ones? What were the issues that you've got to get past? Because obviously you don't want another failure. No one wants another okay, failure. So when I look, researched the, particularly Wilson Park, um, unfortunately, there was a lot of um, activities to start off with. But I believe there were a lot of complaints that came from the community. And if you have a look at Wilson Park, and uh, when I actually went to remove the rest of the, um, the old community garden, not only how you have the police called, a service request went into the um, council and uh, somebody else was, the police were called, the council, somebody else was called. So they were completely scrutinised with everything that they were doing. So they found it very, very difficult to become motivated and continue the garden. Um, I also don't think, and, and no disrespect to the group that set it up, it wasn't very well organised. If you ever go into Wilson Park and have a look at it, it's kind of, well, where was it? And there's a scattering of trees over to the right hand side. And, and this is why I just started from scratch rather than trying to get a group together to um, start a garden up. We needed to put a proposal forward to the council um, and a proposal forward to the community where they would have inspiration and become engaged and, and want to work in this garden. Because to be quite frank, community gardens come with a, almost a, um, they're maybe a little bit mundane, not very exciting. Um, so we wanted to make this a really exciting and an experientially learn, learning, oh, educational um, process for the schools and for the children and also the sustainability of it. So we haven't got the NIMBYs um, around the reserve. We've spoken to all the neighbours and they're all very, very, um, you know, they're very involved in, in the process and are really keen for the garden to go in place. I think one of the things as well is that one of the reasons, so we looked at several sites mm. um, and one of the 
pluses for this site is its high visibility um, because you hide a garden like that away, um, people aren't going to find it. So people are going to trip across this accidentally, if you like, um, and that's a big bonus. Um, and yet it's not, um, the number of neighbours are, are minor and they're in agreement, um, if you like, minor, but they're not like Wilson Park where they're all gathered around. Um, so for it to work successfully, it has to be a visible and vital part of the community as well. Right, we've got Councillor Murray Bench, followed by Councillor Coxhead and then Mayor Denya. Um, so may I ask, Peter, we, we today we decide that the reserve could be used for this purpose. So your decision today is a decision in principle of um, whether you agree or disagree to um, advertise the intent to the wider public of your intention of leasing an area of 2,094 square metres of this reserve for the purposes that have been outlined in the report. Um, so that then goes out for public consultation for a one month period. And then we bring that back. So the ultimate decision sits with full council as the administrating body. So that the actual decision, because you need to hear, um, well, what I'm hearing is 84 percent support. So, but um, you need to give the opportunity for everyone to have their say on the proposal. And so then you can come back. Um, so this is just a decision in principle today, Councillor Murray Bench. Right. Could I just uh, ask, sir, before you go to anyone else? Um, I think it's lovely, but I would suspect that parents and grandparents would want to go and see what the children are doing. Let's and have questions for this part. So, Very good. So how much would you be, do you agree with that? Have you thought of that one? Yes, absolutely, 100%. We, we will be employing a part-time coordinator and educator in the garden, and that person will be on site. They will take bookings, and um, people can come in and be guided around, or we'll have specific working bees um, with, with regards to bringing people into the garden and getting people involved. So we're working closely with the men's shed as well. They're doing a lot of work uh, for us for the garden to bring some uh, well-deserved money into their, their newly designed men's shed. So it's, it's really as a community-based um, project, it really is. In fact, while it's open and we've got someone on site, um, we think it's going to be an asset in that we'd like people to just be able to walk around mm. and enjoy whether they're actively participating or not. So there are places for sitting and um, I see it as a community asset whether people are actively involved in supporting it or whether they simply come to enjoy for an afternoon break or whatever. Thank you. Councillor Coxie. Um, Pippa and Rose, I applaud you for your commitment to this community. I think what you do is amazing and so much goes unnoticed, but I think this is an amazing idea and well done you. Just so I understand exactly where it is, is it just down from Beach House Cafe? Is that's right. Oh, it's still, on my right, it's cross road from me. Yeah, it's right. Even road. better. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you're, you're a little bit further down, aren't you, Tracy? Yeah. Right, me, Denya. I was wanting to move one, two, three, four, six, and seven. Okay. Do I have a second for that? I do, Councillor Joyce. I just want to say it's a great idea. Yes. And um, fully in support of it. And now, um, hope it goes out for consultation and we'll hear, hear the views or any, um, uh, any, any things that need dining out. But um, yeah, fully supportive Thanks. at this point. Thanks. Former Councillor Gowdy is going to force me to break my first rule in my chairmanship and that I have a motion on the table, but as he is the esteemed um, chairperson, he put his hand up. Do you wish to say something? I have a going on our agenda for one more night. We have had the same, or almost the same presentation, so we're right in the group. We've known about this and supported it verbally, but um, you're coming to us and say, what can we do? Thank you. Thank you for making me break the rules. Right. Any further speakers to a motion? Councillor Crawford. Um, just the location, Burnett Community Garden. Um, just thinking about security, like vandalism, people. Um, what are your thoughts? 
Okay, know. so we've added to the community management plan the security issues. Um, the garden will be fenced. It will be traditionally fenced in um, what we're going to do. What uh, um, anyway, the, the, there will be spiked fencing, so access to it <laughs> might be a little bit painful. Okay. <laughs> Um, we're, but, we're hoping to get Manica, um, and if we can't, there's a yeah. eucalyptus that a, a company does that's bound with. Um, so, so you know, when, once we get drill into the nitty gritty, but yes, it's fenced. And can I just also say that from extensive research, that actually con community gardens assist connections, reduce crime, and empower communities. So, with regards to the crime aspect. Um, there's quite a lot of information out there that suggests that it, that it will assist with alleviating crime in the area. We have had some instances of that of late, which is very unfortunate. And Mr Chairman, I understand that the um, fence will be espaliered with um, blackberry and raspberry. <laughs> right, councillors, I have a motion. Oh, you've got it in front of you there, everything except item five and the recommendations moved by... Mayor Deniak, second Councillor Joyce. I'll put that all in favour. Those against, I'll clear it carried. Well, thank you, Papa. Thank you, Rose. Sorry. Yes. Thank you, Papa. Thank you, Rose, for coming down. Always give a little bit of extra time for anyone prepared to come all the way from Waia Beach. It's a, <laughs> certainly some disruption on that road between yes. here and there. So thank you for your time. Um, thank and you. Good luck at the, thank at you for the agenda community board. They've got a pretty tough... Uh, mm. Right, councillors, in our adjusted order, we move to the operational risk and scorecard report, of which we got an updated yep. report. Well, it was uploaded, the new one with some amendments was updated this morning. Apologies for that. So if you had any questions from the first one, or maybe Gary might gloss through some highlights, and then you can pick up any further questions. <laughs> Now we'll stick with the order we changed to. We'll do this and then the town centre funding was programmed to break at 12.30. So we've got 20 minutes to get through these two agenda items. Yeah. You can pop up and get your stone and storm damage, yes. So, um, no, we won't. Well, it's not good, but so, Mr. Chair, so what you've got here is, is there's two components to this report. You've got the uh, six monthly scorecard report, which gives you a bit more detail around the individual project statuses and program status. And then, um, and so we're looking for feedback on whether you're finding that format useful or whether you need more detail or less detail. And secondly, um, we've got a, an overview up an overview and in terms of what the current, I guess, big topical issues are uh, that um, you will all be interested in. Uh, and in terms of an up-to-date picture of it, and in particular with the storm damage, we've got some, um, some of the pictures to go with that. So what I might do to start with, Jim, is we'll just start on that um, storm damage one. Um, so just show that, yeah, you can push the buttons. Yeah, this one's why the Stella. It's in, it's in Stella? Yeah. Okay. So pr probably the main thing here is actually where we've had the um, two storm events. Our biggest hit was the anniversary weekend event, not Cyclone Gabriel. Cyclone Gabriel did cause some damage, but... In the scheme of it, for us, it was minor, and I'd go compared to the rest of this country, um, this area has dodged a bullet. So it's it's um, from Cyclone Gabriel from the anniversary weekend. Um, the estimated damage is now sitting at between fifteen and twenty mil. Um, so that's the significant level of it. Uh, we've got over thirty sites where there are major slips, under slips, or over slips, plus the bridge. Uh, so if I broke the, the costing down, the bridge is seven to eight million and the balance is repairing those underslips or overslips. 
and in some cases, uh, the assessment that is happening, and Jim's already started doing that with the team, is going that there'll be some decisions made about whether you actually repair, reinstate the two lanes or not, and Kapuna Station Road is one of those questions, and we'll come to that in a minute. Uh, and um, just the level of um, repair that is undertaken. Uh, typical costs now where in the past uh, a big underslip um, might have cost half a million to fix, we're getting close to a million as an indicated uh, cost on that. So the cost of doing the proper repairs is, is ramped up. Uh, and the program we're looking at is probably at least two years to go work through the, the repair process. Um, so that's the big picture. Um, Jim, do you probably want to give them the good news about the bridge? <laughs> it's finished. No. Uh, <laughs> not, not that good, Andy. So good morning, everyone. Uh, the good news about the Bailey Bridge on Number 4 Road has been released by NEMA to Waka Kotahi, so we can now carry on with the Waka Kotahi uh, contractor, which is Downers. They've got the national contract, and they're now organising getting the bridge on site based on the program we've got. So the good news is we'll have a bridge. We still have to protect that bridge once it's installed and we have to try and maximize the, the turning circles on and off the bridge on both sides to try and get truck and trailers. That's our objective. At this stage, we can guarantee light vehicles and trucks, but the truck and trailer, the, really it's the safety of the bridge is at issue. If the trucks don't follow their turning circle and cut the corner, the bridge is at risk of collision. So we're putting protection in as much as we can, uh, to, but also try and maximise the productivity uh, for the industry when they start their major picking on the 20th of March. So just going through to the next one. Our time frame based on the program we've uh, put out in the newsletter hasn't changed. Okay. So it's still, we expect to have the bridge in place early March, uh, but then the work, the earthworks, the protection works, and this, the um, approach works will still be ongoing up to that point. Sorry, can I ask one more question? Um, so there was the issue of the stability at one end of the land leading onto the bridge. How's that been resolved? That's been resolved by using piles. So originally, when we didn't believe we had such a stability issue, the bridge could have gone in quite quickly. Uh, but the piling operation has added that week or two, the geotechnical investigation. So in summary, probably three. Uh, but we wanted a solution that was safe and was lasting. Councillor yeah, Crawford, my model deal with this we, is it about number four up, right? Yep. I just commented about the removal of the damage bridge. Jim, is that having some of the time? Yes. Know, like, how are they discussed? Yep, the intention is to undertake that at the same time, uh, to remove it as quick as we can. We've accepted the demolition plan, so the contract is gearing up now to access it by effectively pulling it downstream up and we've got agreement from the property owner to use their area downstream of the bridge and we'll pull it out, uh, break it up first, pull it out in bits and then uh, place it somewhere out of the way initially and then transport it off the site whenever, uh, more likely once the bridge is in. Councillor Wickers. Uh, just a comment, just uh, say what I just heard was fantastic. Well done. Yeah, we've got our fingers crossed that we meet our plan. <laughs> yeah. But we do have a plan. Yeah, yeah. So so we, we had a plan B and a plan C. Yeah. Um, this is plan A, and it's, it's fantastic that it's been released. Um, but given the national situation, there was a, a potential that it might have been used in Hawke's Bay. So... Um, for us and for those residents at Number Four Road, um, it gives them the answer in terms of what they've been looking for, uh, and provides that um, uh, will provide that good access until we get to building the the new bridge. Um, but building the new bridge will need to be a priority in terms of our work program as well. Um, probably just in terms of, I guess we're going to talk about the cost structure. Sorry, there's one wrong number up there, but essentially. 
if we were spending $20 million on the recovery and reinstatement, the cost to council is about 6.2 million. Okay, so because what happens with the financial assistance rate with Wakakotahi is we get our normal rate up to 10% of our program, which means once we spend 1.63 million, that's we get the first 1.63 million, we get 51% on. And then after that, we get what's called enhanced far rate, and that's at 71%. There is ability in the case of hardship to apply for an even in, a higher increase in funding. Um, at this stage, uh, we're not quite sure of the process or whether we'd be eligible. Um, the recent announcement like yesterday in terms of the 250 million that the government has released, that goes in, as we understand it, it goes into the land transport fund, into the emergency work categories, and then it just gets pulled down through the normal processes. And it's um, funding through to the 30th of June. So we expect there will be more coming after that. Uh, and that will be distributed across state highways. So there's obviously those big demands on the state highways, uh, Kiwi Rail and local roads. Um, but the normal, at this stage, the normal processes in terms of the funding apply. Deputy John had a question here. Yeah, um, I'll just note the figure there in terms of the storm damage and that plus or minus 30% cost and relating that back to um, last week, we were told in terms of our insurance policy that we have a $20 million excess. Does that relate to council's share of the costs or to the costs of repairs? Um, I haven't I'm, checked I'm, that. I'm, it may be irrelevant. It's, but. I haven't checked that yet, but I'd probably go to be our net cost. Okay, so, so it's still irrelevant. Uh, yeah, yeah. Likely. Yeah. Thank you. Um, just a point. Yesterday, I spent the day driving around with Westling and the Waka Kotahi Investment Advisor because effectively they have to accept our proposal. Uh, they've got some criteria around whether a, a, a site complies or doesn't comply for emergency works funding. There's always a grey area. We've got the pavement section you drive on and we've got the formation that supports it. And their rules effectively uh, limit their expenditure to only the bit you drive on. So there's a gray area. So we did that yesterday and got a, had a fairly good outcome, but um, a couple of the sites we might do well less than we would normally do on a high volume road on some of the lower volume roads. So that's still in the mix. We're still having those discussions, but it was pretty good. I think it was a good outcome yesterday. They understand that we've got a lot to do. So number four road bridge, uh, there it is in the stream uh, shortly after the event. Uh, another angle there, the abutments on both sides where that workman's standing. Uh, you can see the damage that's been done. That's the abutment piers, the, the piles were all destroyed and damaged. Again, just more photos of debris that came down the, the stream uh, under flood flow. Uh, the detour route through the private property, through the orchards, we've put in some drainage, we've met all the roads, we've widened sections of it. Uh, plan B and C and D uh, incorporated this, uh, the bridge strengthening here near Manawaka Road and the Ford. Uh, we've put that speed restriction on and the current private bridge, even though it's on paper road, um, we've been um, uh, improving the deck capacity to be able to accommodate these less than highway loadings, but it's a backup if needed. Uh, the metalling through the private orchards, and we've got dust control there because the kiwi fruit and avocado producers are worried about the dust on the fruit, legitimately. There's the deck strength. I think it was only the bridge ends that were causing an issue in terms of its uh, structural assumptions. Uh, the Ford, uh, shortly after the event, and the white bags there, cement, uh, concrete filled material in there to support the abutments that had scoured out during the flood. Different angle there at the Ford, there was concern about key fruit trucks entering and exiting the Ford because the gradient was too steep compared one end versus the other side. Uh, hopefully we do not have to do any more work there uh, once the Bailey's in. 
uh, the drilling, pre-drilling here, the geotechnical work, understanding the rock formations um, <laughs> underneath the Tipuki end on number four road and the other side, um, effectively is all fill material. So it was it was less than ideal to build something on, and we've had to result in piling down 20 plus meters to get some solid bedrock to, to found the Bailey Bridge. Again, the forward and a bit of material there being placed and being transported across the stream up onto the um, temporary road. Manawaka Road site improvements. We were concerned that this really was a, a driveway, a single lane that had no good site visibility or passing opportunities for the traffic in the three weeks or so that the public from number four road will be using this route. Um, there was a safety concern, so we tried to improve the sight lines on some of these curves. That's part of our Bailey Bridge installation that came back from Auckland uh, pre the Gabriel was delivered to site uh, because it was either going to go back to Hastings or come to us because the rest of it's in Hastings, it's now coming to us. Um, so it was just a, a, effectively they had two Bailey bridges installed prior to our one. Ours was the next one on the schedule until it got um, put on hold. Jim, I just had a question from Councillor Murray Bent before we carry on. Margaret. So I think I'll question my case. Okay. Just so impressed with the work that's been done so far. We all are, we want to see number four road. Right? Underslip on Wyra Road, um, the um, material has effectively been saturated and just down the valley there is quite um, swampy and so the, really the road structure sitting on saturated soils, um, that's going to be an expensive one. Uh, one option is to move it back to the other side into the hill more. That's the option on all our slips is to retrench them back if we've got the land and suitable material to build on. Overslips, easily cleaned up usually, picked up and put somewhere. Um, Westlink did have trouble on Stay Highway 29. They had so much material, they had nowhere to put it and they needed truck access. So putting in private property is never that easy. Um, certain volumes need a consent over 5,000, but getting, getting your plant back on each truckload is difficult as well in these types of events. Old Kaimai Road, half the road's washed away here, so we'll probably an easy one to fix with rock and fill and trying to control the stormwater better. But Council's development code, we expect a one in 10 year event to be accommodated by a stormwater system. The road culverts out in the rural area are slightly different. The culverts have gone in over the years, uh, assuming that they, the size would match the catchment. But we know that there will always be an event bigger than the infrastructure that's in place to accommodate it. So there will always be overland flow and that overland flow when it gets going, where it discharges to can cause this sort of issue. Um, RP Road Bridge, there's uh, around the abutment some scale there and I don't know if that's a toaster or a microwave, but it presumably provides some scale. <laughs> it's an area. It's an area of historic dumping up in the Tauranga City's water catchment, and Tauranga City asked us to seal this road a few years ago because all the silt coming off the unsealed road was getting into the catchment, affecting the microfiltration plant. Um, but now it's sealed. We've still got this issue to fix. The Omakura Peninsula drone drone shops uh, that have come in, just showing the the ground stability there and the effects of the, the storm and um, where it ends up. Sorry. And obviously a little bit of um, siltration entering the harbour, etc. with each one. Murray, you better ask your question now. Thanks, Jim. I, I seem to recall uh, that the uh, expert from Waikato had a number for the amount of rain over a 25, I think it was our period, um, was a precursor to slips in a mockery. This is research you've done. I can't recall the number, but I would imagine that in the 27th rain event, we had significantly more than whatever his number was. Uh, and as I understand it, everywhere we put in the vertical drains and the horizontal drains, we didn't have any more slips. Is that true? I can't answer that. Um, we haven't had that in detail. Our main concern was were there any big slips to start with. 
Um, and so in this case, uh, no more houses were threatened. We in the previous examples, we've had those houses threatened. Certainly the chimney drains are working as designed and we're very impressed with those. Um, and the horizontal board drains have been working. So there are several hundred horizontal board drains around, around that cliff face. Um, for the, the newer councillors, um, there's an ash layer sort of halfway up. And if that mobilises, it liquefies and literally the top falls off it. Um, and that's where the slips are coming from, not necessarily from erosion or wave action at the bottom. We did get wave action around the golf course um, and it did affect the, um, the stormwater bund we've got there. Uh, but in terms of the slips around the peninsula, um, it worked well this time. What we are doing is we're getting, um, uh, this is drone flown and we're going to get a, a 3D model developed. And so that in future events, we'll just get it flown again and you'll be able to tell exactly what has occurred, um, where the land has moved and how much might have been lost. Um, a very fast uh, way to do it. Gary, I see we've got Manager Curtis here as well. How much more, I'm um, just trying to juggle time here to get this and possibly address the town centre prior to our lunch break? We won't. We won't, okay. So we might have to delay the town centre. Um, perhaps if um, Alison can talk about her part and then she... If you want to talk about your statistics that were in the um, in the scorecard, Alison, and in particular that those replacement pages that went out. Welcome, Alison. Yeah, just conscious of your input there. And yes, I'm, I'm, I'm conscious crack. that Gary's team are very much sort of uh, hogs their time in the terms of the, this committee, um, and um, you know, obviously the, the storm damage is kind of the, the key priority for councillors to be up to speed on. So, um, in terms of the scorecard, you would be aware that we had a couple. Uh, we replaced this the scorecard information. Um, it was essentially only for two pages, um, so they were page on your um, Stella. They are page. Uh, 50 and 51, which was specifically around the growth monitoring statistics. So I've provided a little bit more information um, for councillors to, to review in terms of the dwelling consents, just to kind of give some context, and also the new lots and additional lots proposed. So that just gives context. So those were only two pages that were placed in that scorecard. Alison, we used to get a bit more of a breakdown on, across the district. Um, is that possible going forward? I, I know councillors have looked at specifically whether we could give it by ward or um, around a mokara to Puki where our growth areas are at the moment. So we can certainly do that. Um, I'm conscious that this is there's a new template and I uh, was keen to get your feedback around how that was and whether there's sufficient information and how that's working for you. So. It had the rural dwellings, but it's also important to keep a track on any rural um, lots being created as well. And I fear they might be falling away. But anyway, maybe in subsequent investigations we can see. Certainly, certainly. So it's probably the key things to note in terms of those dwelling consents. They, they are down. Uh, that's in line with um, national and local trends. Um, however, we have got some good news, which is the uh, additional lots that are proposed for those of you that look at page 51. We've got a, a lovely peak on the end of that um, table. Um, and that was um, the information that was provided was incorrect in terms of the, the commentary around that. Those uh, additional lots are specifically from Zest Development in Tabuki. So we had 383 new lots come through there. So it is not an anomaly. Um, it it is uh, reflective of the additional what's coming through there. And probably just also, I have got some commentary on, um, I'm just going back to page. Um, Joy, to yeah. be leading the charge anyway, <laughs> leading the district. Definitely. Um, on page, um, it's page 47, I've just made a little commentary around uh, development activities. We have got a significant amount of development that is um, going to be occurring, obviously, in Tupuki and Mokarawa. We've got two applications that are in already for development in Mokarawa of significant size, which are classics and Mokarawa Country Club. 
um, and the number of lots that are proposed for those specifically. Uh, and I'll just grab the information here. Um, classic developments at 88 Prol Road, that's 138 uh, new lots that are proposed there. Um, and Amokura for um, Amokura Country Club, we're looking at 272 uh, units in terms of that retirement village. So those are the first of the sort of significant developments we can expect in those areas. Thank you. Councillor Daly, you had a question? Uh, <clears throat> just wondering if these figures uh, have been taken into account with the financial contribution figures that we're looking at in the annual plan. In terms of whether they've been um, recognised, yeah. yeah, that those developments were expected to come in. Yes. Okay, well, thank you, Alison, and maybe we'll pick up on that in subsequent reports going forward. Fill out a little bit more detail there. Jim, you got a few more slides for us? Yes, yep. Uh, just a point on the rainfall. Uh, TCC in their Waiari newsletter pointed out that they believe they had a one in 250 year event in that catchment. Uh, we know with each storm, different catchments attract different rainfall and different quantity, even though it was, we had spread right across the anniversary weekend across the district, there's some areas got more rain than others. Uh, Tipuna Station Road, this is the number of slips here, overslips and uh, river, um, effects on the cycleway where the sections have fallen down the bank. The overslips, loss of the cycleway uh, right back to the edge of the carriageway. You see the overslips there in the background. Again, this is an area that the overslips have been occurring regularly over the years. Uh, Question for you, actually, because you're, you're big in that area. What's the people's, I mean, this talk of not reopening this road, right, if the, if the work is too big and it's not going to be stable, what's the feeling locally, people there about possible? Um, it makes, depending which side of the town you live on, but, um, yeah, I haven't heard a, a hue and cry from the northern, I call it northern Tipuna, that not near the harbour, um, having to use Tipuna Road or Station Road as the alternate. So maybe Co Tracy Coxie, have you heard anything? Councillor Coxie. Yeah, I think people are actually largely not that phased if it was shut off. Well, shut off, to be honest. That's And that's coming from some of the quite vocal ones. So, yeah, it's the quiet ones that aren't talking, I don't know. We were going to address that. Gary was going to ask the question. Okay. <laughs> There's great division within the community. And we had a presentation by Transport Agency a long time ago where they did a study on the amount of time saved if that road was closed. And I think if we could pull that one up again, Gary, would be helpful. Okay, well, Karen, I can tell you it took me six minutes and five minutes between those two pinch points today. So there's massive time saving from beyond a Snodgrass Road. Yes, there's the, the four lanes into one at Tapuna. There were traffic's merging there now, so it's having an effect further back on State Highway 2. But this shows here the current average daily traffic trips with Tapuna Station Road when it was open. And this one here shows the impact on the other legs. Um, looks like Clark Road has, has gone up. Um, and of course, Tabuna Road goes up. Yeah, so so we, we are going to get those roads, put some counters out just to see what is actually happening. Um, the Clark Road was just a 25% split, uh, and uh, it feels a bit high in terms of where the population lives, so we, we don't think it'll actually be that high. Yeah. But um, we're getting, getting the current volumes counted, though, and go, this is what the effect is on those roads um, in terms of traffic, but the majority will come out at the roundabout at Tabuna. I did glance this morning as it came past, not a, not a single car on Clark Road, but Councillor Cox said actually lives very close to that area, so she might be able to give some feedback as well. So there's certainly not, they haven't established a rat run around Station Clark from my observation yet, but 
don't put it past them. Once their phones start telling them there's a shortcut, they'll use it. Councillor Joyce. So I just wanted to ask a question. I was going to ask separately, Gary, but Miles will do it in the meeting. Is I mean, presumably when the road closes like this, we inform emergency services so they don't have to find out by themselves. Is that right? You know, we tell the fire brigade and we tell the police and we tell the ambulance so they don't have to. Yep. Do we actually tell Google? Because one of the issues of having traffic going down the roads is people might be trying to use the rat run because Google could be telling them to. Um, and then turning back when they find they can't get through. That may be influencing this quite heavily, right? I mean, I know I tried to, the, the closure on Marshall Road and Cuddy Cuddy, it's still showing as open on Google. So I told them because I do tell them some stuff like that. Um, and they, you know, so I just wonder if we have them included in the process because that would actually help this traffic flow in a situation like that. There is a process with Google to tell them about such things. I, I'm not aware that we're using that process. Uh, we do, Westlink would be advising emergency services when roads are closed. Whether that gets to Google, I don't know. I would suggest that we should add it because that would actually, yeah, you know, some of these traffic flows down the side roads could be because people are trying to follow map software. Just, I've got two questions here, but just, Jim, is there one more slide on this before we, oh, here we go. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Question. Right, Councillor Murray Bean, followed by Deputy Mayor. I'm thrilled to think that Rodney actually has some influence with Google because <laughs> we tried, TCC tried to actually get the right information so that people didn't stop at Emanua Road and go into the wrong place when they were looking for the Emanua track uh, down to the falls. Yep, right. Councillor Scrooge. I was going to make exactly the same comment because I'm not sure what Rodney's influence is, but there's plenty of people tried to convince Google that Tipuki's not in Papamoa Beach. And uh... Right, Gary, what do we require? For... So, probably require nothing at the moment. This is the, the this is the question. It's probably a finger in the wind. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, we'll get the traffic counts. Um, we're looking at the observations on the highway. We know this time of the year gets busier, and particularly the next couple of months with the kiwi fruit season. Uh, the other thing, as Jim talked about before, is we have to go through a process with Wakatai in terms of funding it. Uh, if we reinstated it, um, it's a complex site in terms of you've got your underslips and overslips. We do have our main wastewater pipeline down there as well. Uh, the overslips have been continuing over a number of years, so there's a historical slip every couple of years there that closes the road. Um, probably the options really would be option one, and in my view, the preferred option would be to close it. Uh, with leaving the cycleway open. Um, so you'd close it essentially from Waipuna Hospice to the reserve car park. Or option two, you'd reinstate one lane, one direction. Um, and that would be a more expensive option. So we haven't done the assessment on that. And at the moment, in terms of the repair works that we need to do on the network, and you saw, you know, we've got 30 odd sites, this would not be a priority one because there is the clear alternative access. Um, so this will be remain closed for some time. Can I suggest that from this feedback before I count, take me and Dania, um, that from today's feedback, you make a recommendation to the full council. Yeah, yeah, that's the way we'll handle it. And the ultimate decision might be made today. It'll be made at um, meeting of full council chaired by James, Mayor James. James yeah, I just, um, so in addition to that, obviously the financial and, and engineering constraints and what have you. Um, I just want to signal that I, I'd like to hear the opinion of all the, the residents there, not just the ones for whom the, uh, the rat run is their lifelong bugbear. And um, I'm just wondering if there's a, a process for at least some sort of engagement with the community to, to understand the full, full feeling. Yeah, yeah that, that was the intention was to do through an, an engagement process and actually get um, feedback through a, a survey or mechanism. Um, it's just we we're only two weeks down the track from it happening. We're still in a response phase for everything else. So um, we haven't worked that one out, and that's why I'm going. It'll, it'll stay closed for a bit, and we'll go through that process. You're supposed to say no, because there any chance we'll let the rats and don't even open the door of it. Council? I think so, tied up with all this, is the speed limits down Snodgrass and Tapuna Road. And that encourages people to rat run because they can just put their foot down. 
and travel at 120 k's easily. <laughs> Councillor Coxie. Oh, yeah, I'm not. I'm not convinced about the rat run thing because you'll still have, you know, people legitimately from Davuna having to well, would normally have gone that way because it made more sense. Um, just those numbers. When were they taken? Because Tabuna Station Road's closed off at the top anyway, so the only traffic going down there at the moment is people heading from Clark Road left, and some of us maybe who might it's slip around the back. So it's so it's so, the trucks that are the problem there. So the the numbers that it the end of Tapuna Station Road by the State Highway include the ones from Wairau Road that come under the bridge. Because there's still Tapuna Station Road at that point. Um, but if you go back to the 600 odd, yeah. So so you, already, you will, will always have that traffic at that intersection, but you won't have the ones coming through from Tapuna. I would suggest you just need to stop trucks going up Clark Road though because of the size of the road, it's dangerous, yeah. So the deli. Um, just if we're finished on Tapuna Station Road, can I ask another uh, question? Well, we, yeah, um, but I am conscious of time and I'm conscious that we've got guests coming in at one o'clock under the confidential part. So we're eating into your lunchtime, um, councillors, not that that's critical, but I'd like to tie this up, given a full report's going to come to the next council meeting anyway. Just really, if you had any outstanding questions now that you want to raise something that you want staff to be aware of, if not, Councillor Daly, what's your issue? Um, you've shown some nice pictures of some big slips, but there's some other big slips that you haven't shown, and I, I see you've got 32 other sites, but I just want to make sure that you are aware of Rock and Cutting Road, Tipuka Quarry Road, the four major slips, and probably $4 million to fix those four slips. And what the plan is there, is there more road closures planned? We wouldn't forget Tipuki at all, Councillor Dewey. No, they're all in the list to be um, reacted to or um, addressed. So if there's um, any concerns that we've missed one, I don't expect we have. Um, we'll address them all. I, I did drive up there again last week to see what the status was. I see nothing's happened. The road is now closed. There are some residents who potentially may be stranded without, with no access at, in or out of their house. Which road? Uh, just below Summerhill um, access on Quarry Road. The road is closed there. Yesterday it was open. Was it open yesterday? Yeah. Okay. Well, like I said, I went up there last Thursday, I think. At this stage, uh, we only, we don't have, other than number four road, we've got no roads closed. Some of them are single lane only access, uh, but they are open. If I, right, councillors. Just one just, final thing, if I can. Well, it's not going to be a total of final because you can't come back to this because I've just spoken to Gary and we can reopen this okay. up for any opportunity you've got to look through your... Um, the pack that was loaded up this morning. So I am going to adjourn for lunch right now. We are coming back into a confidential section for our guests over there straight after lunch. And apologies for that. We've juggled around a little bit today, in and out. Hopefully we're back to a 9.30 start and um, get through all our work in the morning and future committees. So I declare it close for lunch and we're back here at one o'clock. See for a quarter of an hour.